I remember the day my older sister died. She died on June 27, 1950, mere hours before the North Korean Communist Army invaded my hometown. Our neighbors were fleeing, but with my sister just dead in the house, we could not do so. I was 17 then, and my baby sister barely three. When the night fell, the bombing became more intense. Bombs exploded all around us, and bullets flew everywhere. A sultry night, I remember, but cold in our terror. We waited for the nightmare to end, but it went on and on with no let up. That night, Seoul, the capital of South Korea, fell. How was I to know then that just two hours up north in the city of Chuncheon, this is Seoul and this is Chuncheon, a young missionary, Irish, was summarily executed on the side of the road by North Korean troops. Father Tony Collier was a member of the missionary group known as the Columban Fathers in Korea since 1933. Back in Ireland, his parents, family, and friends grieved that a young missionary's life was so cruelly cut short in this way. A U.S. Army officer and other friends had urged the Columban fathers to flee, but Father Collier and his colleagues chose to remain. They wanted to share the fate of their people in their darkest and most desperate hours. For this to choice, they were to pay an ultimate price. It was a decision of courage and love, which the people of Korea never forgot. In these brave men, who did not abandon them in their hours of peril, their villagers and parishioners saw the Good Shepherd of the Gospel exemplified. In the villages of Samchok and Mukho, in the province of Kangwon, two other Columbans were dragged from their houses, tortured and interrogated for three long days before they were finally executed. That was the fate of Father James McGinn in Samchuk Parish and Father Patrick Riley in Mukko. They were abandoned where they fell without dignity or burial. Meantime, again in the city of Chuncheon, Father Philip Crosby, Father Frank Canavan just arrived on the mission and Monsignor Thomas Quinlan were arrested. They were taken off by the retreating North Korean forces. Thus, these three men began what came to be known as the infamous death march to the prison camps in North Korea. The winter of 1950 was one of the coldest in record. Many prisoners who were in company with our three Columbans did not survive the cold and hunger that plagued them during their long and tortuous journey across the frozen landscape. Father Canavan subsequently died in December from malnutrition. He told his cellmates that he would have his Christmas dinner in heaven. Father Crosby and Monsignor Quinlan were to spend three long years 
in those terrible North Korean camps before their final release and repatriation. During all that time, these men did not know what became of their Colombian colleagues. From the city of Mokpo, three more Colombian fathers were taken. Monsignor Patrick Brennan from Chicago and Fathers John O'Brien and Thomas Cusack from Ireland are believed to have perished in the massacre that took place in Taejeon. The, three Colomb the remains of three Columbans from Mokpo were never found. For the heartbroken families of these three brave men, there has been no closure to their grief. It's a terrible story, or tragic one. Somehow, the last lines of Francis Thompson's Daisy come to my mind. Nothing begins and nothing ends that is not paid with a moan. For we are born in others' pain and perish in our own. Yes, I suppose we, all of us, are born in the pain of someone else. The fate of many Koreans, thousands, perhaps millions, God alone knows, was born in the pain of these men, their pain of love. Surely it was love, because love can only be bought with the last coin we have. Thank you, fathers. This is, um, I suppose, a plant we erected to the memory of the, uh, the men who died during the Korean War. Tony Collier, Jim McGinn and Patrick Riley worked in Chunchun at the time and um, as you can see from the dates, Tony Collier was killed actually two days after the outbreak of the, um, the conflict. Then in July, Jim McGinn was taken over in Samchuk and um, Paddy O'Reilly and Muko. Down here we have um, Monsignor Patrick Brennan. He was the uh, Prefect Apostolic of Kwangju Diocese. Tom Cusick and John O'Brien were with him in Mokpo at the time and they were taken prisoner and taken off to Taejeon Jail where they were executed at the massacre there on the 24th of September. And here at the bottom we have Frank Canavan. He actually worked in Chunchun Diocese but he was captured and he took part in the infamous death war march and he died in North Korea on the 6th of, um, of December 1950. Now, we put up this monument on Columbus Day 2010, you know, six to mark their, the 60th anniversary of their death, because um, I suppose to keep the memory alive. I mean, <clears throat> all of them had the opportunity to escape. They were warned ahead of time that if they stayed on, they would probably die. But each of them made the, the decision to, uh, to stay in the parish and to stay with their people. And if you look at their ages, the majority of them were in their 30s. Uh, this, um, this man was somewhat older, but he'd been only in Korea two or three years. So um, it was a huge decision in faith. And um, you know, they made it according to their conscience and they were faithful. And I think that memory inspires us today. And that's why um, we put this here. May their memory inspire us.
성지자 묘지 전부리 춘천교구에 아주 유일한 성직자 묘지입니다. 그런데 아, 아, 음, 여기에는 우리 두 분의 주교님 우리 춘천교구에서 아주 오랫동안 사목하신 두 분의 주교님이 묻혀 있는데 먼저 구도마 주교님이 먼저 돌아가셨고요. 여기에는 실제로 그 시신이 우리가 안치되어 있습니다. 그러나 또그 시신을 우리가 찾지 못하고 있습니다. 그런데 이광주 신부님은 유교 때 돌아가셨기 때문에 이제 원산에 계시는데 아마 해방 유교 어 이후로 이제 통일이 되면은 아마 먼저 가서 아마 어이 시신을 아마 모실 걸로 어 준비를 하고 있습니다. 에 그리고 에 저기 나머지 신부님들은 여기 유교 때. 저 진야고보 신부님, 저다 프란치, 저 골론반에 소셨는데요. 그 신부님들 네 분, 선 프란치스코, 라 파트리시오, 어, 고 안토니오, 진야고보 이네 신부님들은 6.25 때 순교하셨습니다. 그 신부님들 묘는 그대로 여기에 시신이 안치되어 있습니다. Well, the, uh... 80th anniversary of the arrival of the Columbans in Korea is a wonderful opportunity to take stock of their contribution, and which, in in our view, would be would be very significant in in Korea. Um, I, I think it's difficult to imagine what kind of Korea they they came to in 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 1933. Very very different from from the Korea of of today. Obviously, uh, Korea today is the 11th or 12th largest economy in the world. Uh, it's a very powerful industrial nation, um, and the contrast couldn't be starker with the Korea of 1933. Uh, predominantly rural, uh, exceptionally poor, uh, lacking in, in development, um, and with a very, in many ways, uh, uh, antiquated social structure. Um, and of course, they had suffered uh, annexation by, by Japan with very concerted efforts to, to eliminate many features of, of traditional uh, Korean culture and identity. Um, so to come from Ireland to this kind of Korea was uh, an immensely courageous thing to do uh, and clearly they, they, they had a lot of, 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 of work ahead of them. Um, to imagine the, the, the missionaries um, coming and anticipating what their work would be is, is probably very difficult for us. I would imagine they didn't expect and couldn't expect what lay ahead. The, uh, the surprise attack um, in, in 1950, uh, the movement of armies north and south, um, devastated the, the whole peninsula. Um, vast amounts of munitions were expended. Um, you had not only uh, Koreans fighting as they were at the beginning, um, but you had um, the Chinese and the American armies um, fighting, fighting a pitched battle, which very quickly established the front line along the original uh, 38th parallel um, but this remained a very very destructive war um, and of course um, the Columbans would suffer directly from that war with um, seven Columban fathers um, losing their lives largely because they wouldn't leave their communities and their flock um, so this was a very direct sacrifice by them um, underlining their, their commitment to, to the Korean people and, and, and to their communities. Um, of course, after the war, you're dealing with an absolutely devastated uh, country. Um, and, um, but the Columban Fathers are then uh, assisted by the arrival in 1955 of uh, the Columban Sisters. Um, and I think, again, it's very difficult to imagine um, the kind of environment that, that the Columban Fathers were arriving into. Um, one, one Columban Father, Father McGlinchey, uh, arrived in Jeju Island, for example, in 1954. Uh, and Jeju Island had suffered uh, horrendously, uh, in fact, at the hands of its own government, um, because uh, the people of Jeju were suspected of being fifth columnists and there was very violent uh, repression, many thousands of people killed. Uh, Father McGlinchey arrives on this island in 1954, uh, very little electricity, no running water, uh, a traumatized population, uh, the people of the interior have been forced to the coast, 
um, mainly thatched cottages. I think there was one slate roof which was in the school. Um, and uh, he spends his life there uh, not only bringing pastoral care but um, economic development, very significant economic development in terms of uh, manufacturing, uh, particularly of woolen garments, which, which he did deliberately to, in, to allow young Jeju women to stay on the island and gain, gain work. Um, but then he revolutionizes uh, agriculture there, bringing in uh, new breeds of, of pigs and sheep, cattle eventually, uh, racehorses, uh, new forms of grass to, to help and so on. Um, so this is a real development uh, in, in the field with a direct impact on the lives of the people of Jeju. Um, the other aspect of course of, of their work was uh, to pass the baton on to, to Koreans themselves who have become uh, members of the Columban Order both as, as, as priests and nuns uh, and they have then gone abroad further to the Philippines and other places on, on mission uh, carrying on the work of the order. Um, so overall the contribution of the Columbans to Korea has been hugely important in, 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 in and of itself but of course from an embassy point of view uh, in, in giving a, a, a profile to Ireland uh, that wouldn't otherwise exist. The most concerted engagement between Ireland and Korea has happened because of, of, the, Columban, of the Columban order and, and, and their mission here. My name is Teresa McGinn Dillon, and Father James Patrick McGinn is my first cousin. My parents gave a party for him before he left for the United States and his return to Korea. And at that party there were uh, several family members and um, many, many neighbors. And I remember Father Jim going around each one individually and giving them a blessing and spending a lot of time with them. When he was asked for his advice, he took the route of peace and prayer in his response to any question or request that was asked of him. And uh, after he returned to Korea, my father and I, every Saturday, evening would visit with uh, Uncle James and of course the talk was always about Father Jim and the new, latest news from Korea and then the Korean War broke out in June 1950 and we didn't hear any more news from him and then I remember that day in 1952 when his brother Frank came to our house and told us that Father Jim was dead. It was such a sense of loss and grieving. Uh, years later when I was in the Matter Hospital in Belfast getting my nurses training I uh, asked a priest from St. Malachy's College to offer Mass for me and he told me to pray through the intercession of Father Jim which I did and later on I prayed and asked through Father Jim's intercession that God would give me the guidance to meet the person that God had selected for me, for to be my spouse. And uh, when I met Jack, I showed him uh, these uh, newspaper cuttings that I had carried around, around with me. And one of them was of Father Jim's grave in Chun Chun. And when Jack looked at that, he said he had been there to his grave and he'd also given money to rebuild the church in Chun Chun. Jack had served in Korea uh, during the war. That was part of his military service. Then in 2002, uh, Jack and I went to Butte, Montana, and we saw the house on East Granite Street where Father Jim spent the first 10 years of his life. Then we went up to the statue of Our Lady of the Rockies, which is built on the Continental Divide, 9,000 feet above sea level. And in the base of that statue, we had placed a plaque in memory of Father Jim. In 2003, we went to South Korea, and we went one Sunday to Chuncheon, went to Mass in the church there, and after Mass, we went to the, the uh, graveyard behind the church, and visited and prayed at Father Jim's grave. That was very meaningful because I 
knew that I was, at that time, the only blood relative who had ever visited his grave. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. Amen. How I found out then about Father John O'Brien, how I got this book, was I got a piece on the paper by the name of Stephanie I didn't put her name, but Stephanie anyway, she organised a mass in, in Dunhamon for the for Father John O'Brien. Well all I can know is Father Jack O'Brien, whose father was a station master in Balladrine. Father Jack and his brother Vincent and Joe was educated in St. Nathis Balladrine. John was born in Dunhamon, the county was common, and Vincent was born in Kilella, the county Mio in nineteen twenty three. Everyone was so, everybody was so upset and that his body couldn't be found. It was, it was an awful time that time. And I, I'd be about, I'd be about 15 years at that time. So it was, it was, it was, it was very hard. I baptised an old man who was, who told me that as a young child he remembered them being arrested, the three Columban priests in Mokpo being arrested and uh, brought into, into a big truck to be carried away and never seen again. And in the, always in the past past 20 years I've met a lot of people who remember, who were baptised by any one of them and they talked about their, their what's about their kindness and their openness and uh, how friendly they were to this, these small children at the time. It would have been most unusual to have a, a, foreign, a, foreign, a foreigner being so close to Koreans. Particularly called to memory the men who were arrested or kidnapped during the Korean War and were in jail in Kwangju for a while before. They were taken with the other prisoners on a mark up the country, intended to go to North Korea. What happened then, of course, at that time was that the American army and the United Nations started to shoot at them and bomb them and in other places as well. But what they did was they, they uh, killed all the prisoners in Techa, just halfway up the country. And that's the last place that Monsignor Patrick Brennan and Father Tom Cusick and Father John O'Brien were seen, the 24th of September 1950. Their bodies were never found. Frank Canavan. Frank was a very young guy, he was still learning the language really, he should have been, you would almost think, ordered out of the country. Down south they ordered the younger guys out and they went to Japan because they couldn't speak the language for one thing. But Frank was captured and he was the youngest of the three, Phil Crosby was the other, and Frank died on the 6th of December in North Korea in the prison there. And Frank's sister for years and years, we often forget that those martyrs had families and they had families in Ireland and in America and we sort of forget about them that they're, we think that they're the Columban family but they also had relations who wanted information and spent years hoping for some news like Frank's sister uh, was always hoping that they could get recover his body maybe and bury it down here but <coughs> uh, just in the last few years these group of relations of the martyrs have got together and because of their pushing us we went and found more information on the martyrs and uh, especially the three that were killed that were martyred in Tejan. We didn't, we knew they were martyred, there was thousands of people killed in the prison in Tejan, but <coughs> it was only lately that one of our associate priests who's now working in Chile, Pio, his father had actually done a lot of background on this. He personally knew Bishop Quinlan and he had done a lot of background and he had collected the bones that were still scattered there and he had buried them in his own compound. So it's in light of that general looking back over our history that suddenly our uh, martyrs took on, um, I suppose, a new importance in, in the whole running of things and we've set up the monument uh, in the garden and um, I think the two dioceses that they came from, four of them from Chuncheon Diocese and three from Kwangju Diocese, uh, those dioceses have now started the process of beatification 
for uh, not only our men, but uh, others who were martyred during the Korean War. So it gives you a sense of sort of gratification that the local church is also acknowledges the contribution that the men made, some of them by giving their lives. At the time of the war then, as we know, like seven Columbans died and there was only just about 30 something and practically a quarter of the Columbans were martyred at that time. And I use martyrdom, you know, like very deliberately because um, they were given the opportunity to leave. They were told that if they stayed around, uh, they would probably be killed in view of uh, what was happening in other areas. And yet uh, they choose to stay with the people, both in Chunchun and in Mokpo. And uh, the result was they were arrested and we know the rest of the story. They were executed and one man died in North Korea, you know, during that infamous long, long march. Like after the war then, Korea was absolutely, you know, decimated like all wars <laughs> do that to people, you know. And um, so the missionaries were involved actually in, in trying to rebuild the country with the people. And that was the whole energy of the church in the 50s and 60s, basically going into the 70s, was focused on the rebuilding and the um, modernization, if you want to call it that, of the, of the, uh, the country. And... Um, the memory, though, of the, the dead, of the martyrs, was always very strong, I think, you know, among the, uh, the Columbans. And just to give one example, in 1980 in Kwangju, when the, the whole, um, you know, democratic movement was blooming or bursting forth and the military intervened in the city, the foreign ministry at that time contacted the Columbans here in Seoul and asked that all foreigners be moved out of the city of Kwangju. And um, the director at the time, Michael Dodd, with great difficulty because the phone lines were down, contacted the Columbans and said, like, the orders come for the ministry to um, evacuate. And um, what the Columbans actually, it was, uh, they were all gathered in the house, I think it was a Monday evening, and they said, um, the Columbans stayed with the people at the time of the war. Uh, we were staying in Kwangju. And I think they opened a, a bottle and had a jar, you know. <laughs> And um, I think it's that type of um, influence, the memory like empowers the, um, you know, the present generation. It certainly empowers the Catholics because as I said, they're so close. They remember like that the, that the people actually, um, you know, died for this and lived for it. And I think it's the same with the Columbans. We're beginning to realize like how powerful um, an influence or this can be in our own lives today as we strive to, uh, I suppose, to rise up to meet the new challenges of Korea, like of the 21st century.